As we are looking at Ukraine trying to hold the land that it has been able to clear, that it has taken back from Russia, right now the U.S. is providing weapons for missiles for the HIMARS systems right. that go about 50 miles. Ukraine would obviously like them to go further, but going 200 miles, the U.S. says no. 50 miles, yes. What would reach that threshold for you of saying yes to a weapon that would go 200 miles? Well, the, the, the reason the administration, I think, is reluctant, we had a briefing on this just yesterday, is there are a number of reasons, some of which I can share with you, some I can't, but the, the reason is it, it would clearly be an escalation. It would clearly invite Putin to take further escalatory steps. I think in answer to your question, what would it take for me to support those additional weapons would be if Putin escalates. And here's the great danger, Brianna. Here's the, the, the paradox of the situation we're in right now is the better the Ukrainians do, the more dangerous Putin becomes, the more he's backed into a corner. And he's getting pressure in Russia, if you read the press, not from people who say, let's get this over with, let's get out. He's getting pressure from people saying, do more. And his pattern in Aleppo, in Syria, in Grozny, in Chechnya is bomb the crap out of them. Civilians, carpet bomb. And that's what I'm worried about. I think the most likely next step is for Putin to step up attacks on civilian in infrastructure. And then we're going to have to think about how we and the Ukrainians respond. The Kremlin may be shifting its strategy in an apparent attempt to gain back momentum. As Ukraine continues to make incremental gains more than one week after its lightning-fast counteroffensive in the east, Russian media are reporting Moscow-backed separatist leaders in the Luhansk and Donetsk regions are calling for immediate referendums on joining Russia. It comes one day after Ukraine claimed its forces had liberated another village in the Luhansk region and destroyed a Russian military base. State media are also reporting that pro-Russian officials in the occupied Kherson and Zaporizhia regions plan to hold votes on whether to become part of Russia in the coming days as well. Ukraine responded by saying that this is what the fear of defeat looks like, adding that sham referendums will not change anything. And the Luhansk regional governor had this to say. All they can do now is hold referendums in a hurry, certainly fake ones with some made-up results. They would do so in order to join occupied territories of Ukraine with the Russian Federation so that they can do things later on. Russia's former president, Dmitry Medvedev, meanwhile predicted that if the breakaway regions decide to join Russia, it would allow Moscow to utilize its full military capability in the Donbass region. It's a move that threatens to escalate this conflict even further. Let's bring in CNN's Ben Wiedemann, who joins us live now from uh, Kharkiv. So, Ben, I just want to get your take on this, this idea that Russian installed leaders in occupied areas are holding sham referendums on joining Russia. What does that say about Putin's strategy? And, and just walk us through more of the Ukrainian reaction here. Well, I think what it says is that this is his next move following uh, the loss of much of the Kharkiv region in the first two weeks of September. Uh, this could possibly change the entire landscape uh, of this conflict because these, uh, for instance, the Donetsk and Luhansk People's Republic, these breakaway republics that declared their independence in 2014 uh, by voting in favor in these referenda to join Russia would essentially mean that those areas, as far as Russia is concerned, would become part of the Russian Federation. And therefore, the war that's going on in those areas will be a war inside, as far as Moscow is concerned, a Russian territory. And if it's a war and no longer what Moscow calls it, the special military operation, that brings in all sorts of potentialities, like, for instance, mass military conscription and perhaps the use of the kind of weaponry uh, that Moscow has been holding back in this conflict. And at this point, I don't think there's much question about the possible outcome of these referenda, which will be held between the 23rd and the 27th of, of September. Keep in mind that in 2014, when Russian forces entered Crimea, 
there was a referendum shortly thereafter, and 97 percent, according to the Russian authorities, voted in favor of joining the Russian Federation. Now, I was there in Crimea at the time, and it was obvious uh, that not everyone, certainly not 97 percent of the population, was in favor of joining Russia. But that's what happened, and we could very well see a repeat in these four regions. Zane? And then I want to talk about Izium. Uh, just explain to us the sort of nightmarish experience and the trauma in terms of what people in Izium have been living with, live been, have been living with as a result of, of Russian occupation. Well, for the first few months of the war, Izium, through which a river flows, uh, was divided between one side of the river with Ukrainian forces, the other side with Russian forces, and it was a vicious battle there. Uh, the city, is, parts of it are just absolutely destroyed. Uh, and then when the Russians took over in the spring, uh, they instituted a reign of, I wouldn't call it terror, but sort of chaos. Uh, people told us that they were afraid to go out into the street, that very little was provided in terms of basic uh, services or food. We spoke to one woman, 85 years old, who had a stroke but never received uh, med any medical assistance. Now, people are happy that the Russians are gone, but life still is a struggle in Izium. Help arrives in Izium, bags of barley meal, tins of food. Waiting her turn, Inessa shrugs off the tribulations of late. She's seen worse. We survived World War II when I was little, she tells me. Surgeon Oksana Karpetian hands out medicine. Sedatives are in high demand. They've got half of a year, six months, without any help. You can um, understand what, what do they, what, uh, just imagine what, what, what do they feel. Liberation from Russia isn't the end of Izium's troubles. Much of the city was severely bombarded before falling in spring to the Russians. There's no running water, no electricity, no heat. Crowds gather to charge cell phones off an army generator and make calls, 10 minutes per person, using internet provided by a satellite connection. Lubov and her daughter Angela are calling relatives. They want to leave. Winter is coming. People will freeze, Angela warns. Older people won't survive. They also fear the Russians could return. Nearby, the signs of their hasty retreat. Helmets strewn outside a house Russian soldiers commandeered. Breadcrumbs still on the table. Insects make a meal of fruit half eaten. On the edge of town, the remains of Russia's once vaunted army before a monument harking back to a different time, which now seems like the distant past. Natasha shows me a newspaper distributed during the occupation. What does she think of him? I haven't thought anything good about him since 2000, she says. He destroyed everything in Russia. The paper does, however, come in handy. Now, President Zelensky has said that the government will do all it can to restore those basic services as early as possible, because going through the winter in this part of Ukraine without heating will be very difficult. Reconstructing, reconstructing the city, however, is going to be much, much more difficult.